sensory reception and processing eye and ear uh, reflex action and everything is there yeah till reflex action it's there till reflex action okay yes all right okay so after reflex action nothing is there like the whole part is deleted yes all right now to begin with our chapter you know at this time now since very less time is left uh, like did you uh, like is your admit card out for neat yes ma'am admit card is out yeah okay so like currently you are in india yes ma'am i am in india bangalore so is the center near your uh, place or is it far away the thing is uh, in the admit card uh, in the application form basically uh, there was no center written there so i have to i think log in to the website and check for okay. the center your exam is on 5th may right yes okay today is 21st april yeah now you know at this point you must revise all the tiny knickknacks and concentrate on ncert because very less time is left are you excited or are you nervous or both uh, more on the nervous side only nervous yeah because i'm just like right now concentrating more on 11th and there's no like time for 12th revision mm -hmm. I, i still need a bit of revision for that and uh, and how is 12th biology 12th biology uh, i mean it's way better than that of 11th yeah i know most of the things sir okay good because you know the time that we have uh we can cover 11th biology very nicely but 12th i don't think so we can cover it as i'm covering the 11th one we'll have to do it very quickly mm -hmm. if time is left then mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but but i am also like tension free regarding of that because i know that you have also said that your preparation is good for 12th so i have mm -hmm. i don't have any tension regarding that the only thing that bothered me was like 11th syllabus which is quite long bigger than uh, 12th syllabus yeah, yeah. Hmm. all right <clears throat> now coordination is the process through which two or more organs interact and complement the functions of one another for example when we do physical exercises the energy demand is increased for maintaining an increased muscular activity the supply is of oxygen is also increased now the increased supply of oxygen necessitates an increase in the rate of respiration heartbeat and increased blood flow via blood vessels when physical exercise is stopped the activities of nerves lungs heart and kidney gradually return to their normal conditions thus the functions of muscles lungs heart blood all are coordinated while performing physical exercises in our body the neural system and the endocrine system jointly coordinate and integrate all the activities of the organs so that they perform in a synchronized fashion so our neural system is very uh, like closely connected to our what the endocrine system that is the whole hormonal system of our body they work side by side and many a times their activities are aligned together like because of the hormones certain neural mechanism will be taking place in our body so it is all coordinated now how is the temperature in bangalore it's very hot uh yeah kind of it's very hot the neural system provides an organized network of point to point connections for a quick coordination the endocrine system provides chemical integration through hormones in this chapter you will learn about the neural system of human mechanism of neural coordination like the transmission of nerve impulse impulse conduction across a synapse and the physiology of reflex action now the neural system now the neural system of all animal is com uh, composed of highly specialized cells called as neurons 
just like how nephrons were the unit of the excretory system same way neurons are the unit of the nervous system these neurons can detect receive and transmit different kinds of stimuli the neural organization is very simple in lower invertebrates for example in hydra it is composed of a network of neurons the neural system is better organized in insects where a brain is present along with a number of ganglia and neural tissues vertebrates have a more developed neural system now as we move from the lower invertebrates such as the phylum porifera and we we'll move to the chordata so up till there we'll see that slowly slowly the brain and the neural system or the nervous system is you can say developing more and more and we have a better uh, you can say coordination all through our body if we compare ourselves to the sponges or cilad fish or also if we compare ourselves to the fishes so now the human neural system the human neural system is divided into two parts the cns and the pns the central nervous system the peripheral nervous system the cns or the central nervous system it includes the brain and the spinal cord the two the two components of the cns the brain and the spinal cord and is the site of information processing and control the pns that is peripheral nervous system comprises of all the nerves of the body associated with the cns so if cns has brain and spinal cord so the cranial nerves meaning the nerves from the brain the spinal nerve they will be there in the pns apart from that the nerve fibers of the pns are of two types afferent efferent now afferent nerve fibers transmit impulses from tissues or organs to the cns so it takes the impulse like whatever we are feeling it takes that to the brain now the efferent fibers transmit regulatory impulses from the cns to the concerned peripheral tissue or organs meaning now when our brain has comprehend what we have to do then the efferent fiber will bring that information to the point wherein for example a muscle so we'll move the eye hand or we'll do anything of that sort so that is the work of pns apart from that these are the two fibers that are found in the pns now talking about the pns it is divided into two divisions that is known as somatic neural system and autonomic neural system the somatic neural system it relays impulses from the cns to the skeletal muscles while the autonomic neural system transmit impulses from the cns to the involuntary organs and smooth muscles of our body so autonomic is for all those things that are not under our will that are not under our control whereas somatic is something that is under our control mostly the skeletal muscles of our body now what is the other name for skeletal muscles the other name for skeletal muscles hmm we have studied this yesterday only hmm students the other name for skeletal muscle is striated muscle right which gives a stripe appearance isn't it it is voluntary in nature meaning it is our, under our control now the autonomic nervous system or the neural system is further classified into sympathetic neural system and parasympathetic neural system both of these neural systems activities are antagonistic to each other meaning just the opposite of each other talking about the visceral nervous system is the part of the pns that comprises whole complex of nerves fibers ganglia and plexuses by which impulses travel from the cns to the viscera and from the viscera to the cns it is mostly present in the internal organs so or the visceral organs so that is visceral nervous system up until now you like are you clear with the division of the human neural system the cns the pns the fibers that yes, are there everything is clear okay now we'll talk about the structure of a neuron 
Now, neuron is the structural and functional unit of the nervous system. A neuron is a microscopic structure. Also, remember one thing that out of all the cells that are there, neuron is one of the longest cell. It's not the largest cell, but it is the longest cell. It's very long. Okay. So, it comprises of three major parts, namely cell body, dendrites, and axons. The cell body contains the cytoplasm, which typical cell organelles and certain granular bodies that are known as Nissel's gram. For example, if this is the cell body and this is the nucleus, so it will have many granules present in it that will be known as Nissel's granules. Now, short fibers which branch repeatedly and project out of the cell body also contain Nissel's granules and are known as dendrites. These branch-like structures that arise from the cell body, these are the dendrites. Now, these fibers transmit impulses towards the cell body. So, it brings all the impulses towards the cell body. Then comes the axon, this long portion. The axon is a long fiber, the distal end of which is branched, meaning the back end, this part is branched. Each branch terminates as a bulb-like structure, which is known as a synaptic knob, which possess synaptic vesicles containing chemicals known as neurotransmitter. Do you people remember the name of a very famous neurotransmitter of our body? Hmm? Very famous neurotransmitter of our body. It starts with an A. Do you know that chemical? The name of the chemical? Yes or no? Do you, uh, have you heard about acetylcholine? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so acetylcholine is that neurotransmitter. And that acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, is present in the synaptic knobs only, the vesicles. Now, the axons transmit nerve impulses away from the cell body to a synapse. Synapse means a gap, okay, to a synapse or it transmits it to a neuromuscular junction, the junction of a neuron and a muscle. Based on the number of axon and dendrites, the neurons can be divided into three types. The neurons can be of three types. If we take the number of axons and dendrites into consideration, so starting off, we have multipolar, meaning one axon and two or more dendrites. Where is it found? It is mostly found in the cerebral cortex, meaning in our brain. Then there is bipolar neuron, one axon, one dendrite. Where is it found? So it is found in the retina of the eye. See, the type of axon depending upon the number of, the types of neuron, depending upon the number of axon and dendrite and their example, this is very important. This can come and match the following. So here, uh, one axon and one dendrite is there and it is found in the retina of the eye. Then there is unipolar cell body with one axon only. Only one axon is there, no dendrite, and it is usually found in the embryonic state when the human is not even born. Now, there are two types of axons, namely myelinated and non-myelinated. Myelinated, what is myelinated? See, uh, if you see on the axon, these purple cells, these are sort of like the insulating covering, a layer which is present on the axon, and that layer is known as myelin sheet. So, whichever axon that has the myelin sheath, we'll call them as myelinated axon. And the ones that do not, we'll call them as non-myelinated axon. Now, the myelinated nerve fibers are enveloped with swan cells, which form a myelin sheath around the axon. Now, these axons, they are actually surrounded by swan cell and the myelin sheath is secreted by the swan cell. So, on those axons on which the spawn cell has secreted the myelin sheet, we'll call them as the myelinated axon and the other one will be non-myelin. The gaps between two adjacent myelin sheets are called nodes of Ranvier. 
these gaps that you see here, these are the nodes of RAN. Myelinated nerve fibers are found in the spinal and the cranial nerves. Unmyelinated nerve fiber is enclosed by a swan cell that does not form a myelin sheet around the eyes. And it is commonly found in the autonomous and somatic nervous system. So, ANS and the somatic nervous system. So, in these two, we have the non-myelinated, meaning the axon is not covered by the myelin sheet in these two. And the ones that are found in our, uh, this thing, the spinal and the cranial nerves, they are myelinated. Now, we'll talk about the generation and conduction of the nerve impulse. Neurons are excitable cells because their membranes are in a polarized state. Polarized means charged. Okay. Now, different types of ions or ion channels are present on the neural membrane. The, these ion channels are selectively permeable to different ions. Ion channels are sort of like gates. Imagine them as gate and they can either permit the ion to come inside or they can allow the ion to go outside. So, they are selectively permeable. Now, when a neuron is not conducting any impulse, meaning that it is resting, the axon mem axonal membrane is comparatively more permeable to potassium and nearly impermeable to sodium. When the neuron is a, like in a resting state, at that point of time, the axon or the membrane of the axon will not be permeable to sodium, but it will be permeable to potassium ions. Similarly, the membrane is impermeable to negatively charged proteins present in the axoplasm. Just like how cytoplasm is there for cell, sarcoplasm is there for muscle cell, so axoplasm is there for axon. Consequently, the axoplasm inside the axon contains high concentration of potassium ions and negatively charged proteins and low concentration of sodium ions because it's not permitted. Now, in contrast, the fluid outside the axon contains a low concentration of potassium and a high concentration of sodium, just the opposite. And because of this, there is a concentration gradient setup because one thing is more at one end and it is less at another end. So that is a concentration gradient. Now, these ionic gradients across the resting membrane are maintained by the active transport of ions by sodium-potassium pumps. Now, for the conduction of nerve impulse, both the ions are important. Sodium ion is also important and potassium ion is also important. So, because of that very reason, there is a pump setup. Okay, and uh, like a pump is there so that what will it do? It will perform the, like you can say, influx and efflux of the ions. So, this sodium-potassium pump, which transports three sodium outwards for two potassium into the cell. As a result, the outer surface of the axonal membrane, it possesses a positive charge, while its inner surface becomes negatively charged and therefore is polarized. Now it is charged. The electrical potential difference across the resting plasma membrane is known as resting potential, meaning at the resting state. You might be curious to know about the mechanism of generation of nerve impulse and its conduction along an axon. When a stimulus is applied at the site on the polarized membrane, the membrane of the site A becomes freely permeable to sodium. This leads to the rapid influx of sodium followed by the reversal of the polarity at that site. Meaning now, once the sodium will get inside, the outer surface becomes negatively charged and the inner surface becomes positively charged, just the opposite. The polarity of the membrane at site A See, this point. Meaning this point is getting polarized. The sodium is getting in flux because of which the polarity is changing from positive to negative. So it gets reversed and hence depolarized. The electrical potential difference across the plasma membrane at the site A is called as the action potential. Now this action potential is a fancy word for nerve impulse. Meaning if an action potential is generated, then only the nerve can, like the impulse, can travel all through the body. Now, at sites immediately ahead, the axon example for the site B, 
Now we're moving to the next side. That is from here, we'll move to the side B. Now, what will happen then? Now, at that side, since nothing has been influxed yet, meaning the sodium has not come inside yet. So, the, the positive charge is there maintained, just like how it was initially. The outer surface will be positively charged. The inner one will be negative. So, there it has a positive charge on the outer surface and a negative charge on its inner surface. As a result, a current flows on the inner surface from side A to side B. On the outer surface, current flows from side B to side A to complete the circuit of the current flow. Usually, the current flows from where? Negative to positive or from positive to negative? The flow of current? Hmm? Yeah, same thing that will happen here. Now, because of this flow of current, the polarity at the site is reversed and an action potential is generated at the site B. Now, from the site A, it goes to the site B. Thus, the impulse or the action potential generated at site A arrives at site B. The sequence is repeated along the length of the axon, meaning the whole entire length. And consequently, the impulse is conducted. The rise in the stimulus induced permeability to sodium. It is extremely short-lived. It is quickly followed by a rise in the permeability to potassium. Meaning this doesn't happen for a really long period of time. It happens quickly and then it's over and back to the state. Within a fraction of a second, potassium ion diffuses outside the membrane and restores the resting potential of the membrane at the site of excitation. And the fiber becomes one more, once more responsive to further stimulation. So after the impulse has been conducted and from A it moves to B, then again it gets back to the normal state that it was originally. And uh, with that being said, it is ready to get another impulse. So this is how the nerve impulse is conducted. This much is clear, students? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now talking about the transmission of impulses. A nerve impulse is transmitted from one neuron to another through the junctions known as synapse. For example, this is one cell body, this is an axon and these are the nerve ends. Now join to this after a gap, like this will be a gap and there will be another cell body. And like that. So, so, this is how it will be connected throughout. Okay. So, now the point or the uh, you can say the gap between two neurons is the what? It is the synapse. Now, a synapse is formed by the membranes of a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron, which may or may not be separated by a gap known as synaptic cleft. There are two types of synapses, namely electrical synapse and chemical synapse. At electrical synapse, the membrane of pre- and post-synaptic neurons are in a very close proximity for electrical impulses, like they are very closely situated. Then only the electric charge can flow from one place to another, right? So, the electric current can flow directly from one neuron to another through these synapses. The transmission of an impulse across electrical synapses is very similar to impulse conduction along a single axon. Impulse transmission across an electrical synapse is always faster than that across a chemical synapse. So electrical impulses are faster. Electrical synapses are rare in our system. Even though electrical synapses are much faster, but it's very rare in our body. We have chemical synapses. Now at a chemical synapse, the membrane of the pre and the post synaptic neuron are separated by a fluid filled space which is known as synaptic cleft. The chemicals known as neurotransmitter are involved in the transmission of impulses at the synapse because this chemical synapse meaning it is dependent on the chemical. Now the axon terminals contain the vesicles filled with these neurotransmitter. When an impulse or action potential arrives at the axon terminal 
it stimulates the movement of the synaptic vesicle towards the membrane where they fuse with the plasma where they will fuse with the plasma membrane and release their neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft meaning that space now the released neurotransmitters they bind to their specific receptors present on the post synaptic membrane this binding opens ion channel allowing the entry of ions which can generate a new potential in the post synaptic neuron post synaptic neuron means first neuron is there then there is a space so this first neuron becomes the pre synaptic neuron after the synapse comes the next neuron which becomes the post synaptic neuron the new potential developed may either be excitatory or inhibitory meaning it may cause a different kind of motion or it may cause the inhibition of the motion so this is how the nerve impulse is transmitted from one nerve or the like from one to another like two in between two nerves and apart from that there are two types of synapses there is electrical synapse and then there is chemical synapse electrical synapse are rare chemical synapse are what happens in our body now tell me any doubts Also, the neurotransmitter that has been released that goes and binds with a specific receptor because all the enzymes work in that way, only. and also the hormones. So, do you have any doubts up until now? Hmm? No, ma'am. No. Okay. Now, moving forward. we'll talk about the cns our central nervous system that is responsible for the all like all the coordination involuntary voluntary coordination of our body now talking about the cns that is central nervous system the brain is the center in central information processing organ of our body and acts as the command and control system it controls the voluntary movements balance of the body functioning of vital involuntary organs like heart lungs kidneys and the thermoregulation meaning the temperature regulation the hunger the thirst the circadian cycle like like sleep wake cycle of our body then several endocrine glands human behavior every single thing in our body is controlled by the brain and brain is the main part or you can say one of the components of the central nervous system now it is also the site for processing of vision hearing speech memory intelligence emotions and thought all of these things are also the site where, like they are processed at the brain only now human brain is well like well developed and it is well protected by the skull inside the skull the brain is covered by cranial meninges meninges are coverings consisting of an outer layer the outer meninges will be known as the dura mater a very thin middle layer will be known as arachnoid and then the innermost layer which is in contact with the brain tissue is known as the pia mater three layers like the meninges are made up of three layers the brain can be divided into three major parts that is fore brain mid brain and hind talking about the fore brain now the fore brain consists of cerebrum thalamus and hypothalamus cerebrum forms the major part of the human brain this is the most important part of our brain like without if you remove any person's cerebrum that person is of no use to anyone so cerebrum is the most important part and what like it like uh, it is the major part actually of the fore brain now a deep cleft divides the cerebrum longitudinally meaning in a longitudinal position into two halves so this is one half of the brain this is the another if you are looking at the brain from like here okay then it has been divided into two halves which are termed as the like the left hemisphere the right hemisphere and both of them are the cerebral hemispheres now these hemispheres they are connected by a tract of nerve fibers called as the ca corpus callosum this corpus callosum is a very characteristic feature of human brain it is found in humans and it is well developed in humans also 
apart from that uh, the layer of cells which covers the cerebral hemisphere is known as cerebral cortex and is thrown into prominent fold everyone knows the diagram of the brain if you draw it it's like always like this like certain structures are there right in the brain these are the folds of the cerebral the cerebral folds are there and it is because of the cerebral cortex the cerebral cortex is referred to as the gray matter due to its grayish appearance so another name for cerebral cortex is gray matter the neuron cell bodies are concentrated here giving the color so then because uh, this part of the brain that is the cortex part of the brain it has a lot of neurons concentrated in that area because of which it has the color gray uh, of the thing now the cerebral cortex contain major areas such as the sensory areas the motor area is there sensory area is there and uh, apart from that there is a large region that is neither sensory nor motor that is the inter relay or the association area so three types of areas are actually present in the cerebral cortex now moving forward now these regions are known as association areas are are responsible for complex functions like intersensory association memory and communication the fibers of the tracts are covered with myelin sheath which constitute the inner part of the cerebral hemisphere they give an opaque white appearance to the layer and hence is called as the white matter towards the inner part like the inner part is whitish the outer part is grayish and the cerebrum wraps around a structure which is known as thalamus if you look at here in the diagram let's see where thalamus is hmm. see this this thalamus is actually wrapped around by this whole entire thing which is the cerebrum it is the major part of our brain and it is wrapping the thalamus which uh, now this thalamus is a major coordinating center for sensory and motor signaling another very important part of the brain is known as the hypothalamus and it lies at the base of the thalamus the hypothalamus contains a number of centers which control body temperature urge for eating and drinking all of these things are controlled by our hypothalamus now it contains several groups of neurosecretory cells which secrete hormones known as hypothalamic hormones we know that hypothalamus is a mm, endocrine gland and endocrine glands are responsible for releasing the hormones synthesizing and secreting the hormones so that is why it has another function that it releases the hormones the inner parts of the cerebral hemispheres and a group of associated deep structures like amygdala hippocampus etc form a complex structure called the limbic lobe or the limbic system along with the hypothalamus it is involved in the regulation of sexual behavior expression of emotional reactions such as excitement pleasure rage and fear and also motivation so we have a limbic system so limbic system with the hypothalamus regulates these feeling feelings inside us sometimes we feel so demotivated so maybe our limbic system is not working well for that point of time isn't it so uh, yeah and our limbic system contains the structures such as amygdala and hippocampus so this was about the four brain now if someone asks you like what is the function of four brain so you should tell them that it has the major function of a body right from the intellectual things meaning reading writing the condition reflexes then body temperature feeling speech formation then also when we see something and our brain comprehends it and we understand like for example if i look at a bottle i would understand that it is a bottle and not a pen because my brain and because of my cerebrum or the four brain only these are the function now moving on to the mid brain now mid brain is located between the thalamus or hypothalamus of the four brain and the pons of the hind brain a canal called as cerebral aqueduct passes through the mid brain 
The dorsal portion of the midbrain consists of four round swellings or lobes known as corpora quadrigemina. It, it, it has four lobes present in the midbrain and these are known as the corpora quadrigemina. Lastly, there is the hindbrain. The hindbrain comprises of the pons, the cerebellum and the medulla, also known as the medulla oblongata. Pons consist of fiber tracts that interconnect different regions of the brain. Cerebellum, cerebellum has very convoluted surface in order to provide additional space for many more neurons. The medulla of the brain is connected to the spinal cord. Now the medulla contains centers which control respiration, cardiovascular reflexes and gastric secretions. Three major regions make up the brain stem. The midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Very important. Like the mid, like the mid, uh, this thing. Brain stem consists of three things: midbrain, pons, and medulla. Now, brain stem forms the connection between the brain and the spine. So this is all about the hindbrain. Now, with respect to position, like the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain, they like they are given their names and they are studied according to the position that they are in. Whole brain, present this part, right? Hind brain is the example or the, or the lower most part. So all of the parts of the human brain, they are actually situated with the help of the position that they are found in. So the parts of the brain is clear to you people? Hmm? Yes, ma'am. Any doubts? No. Sure? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Okay. Now, moving forward, let us talk about the reflex action and the reflex arc. You must have experienced a sudden withdrawal of a body part which comes in contact with objects that are extremely hot, extremely cold, pointed, or animals that are scary or poisonous. The entire process of response to a peripheral nervous stimulation that occurs involuntarily. You don't have to think about it. As soon as you touch a hot cup of tea, you will draw your hand back. No one is going to hold it for a while. So that motion or that movement is involuntary. It is not under our control. Now, it is involuntary. That is without conscious effort or thoughts and requires the involvement of the main part of the CNS and it, this type of motion is the reflex action. The reflex pathway comprises at least one afferent neuron that is the receptor. It will get the reception. It will get the signal. And then there is one efferent or effector or exciter neuron and these are arranged in a sequence. The afferent neuron receives signal from the sensory organ and transmits the impulse via dorsal nerve root into the CNS. But this information does not go up to the brain level. It stays up to the spinal cord level because we need quick action. So from the uh, spinal cord, the efferent neuron then carries signals to the effector. Effector is the organ. For example, if you're touching a hot uh, cup of tea or whatever, this hand becomes the effector and the effector also is the muscle that will move the hand back. So the stimulus and response thus forms a reflex arc as shown below. This is the knee jerk reflex. So the response now this the stimulus is provided and this is carried by the aff like afferent neuron. It goes like it passes through the dorsal root ganglion reaches up till the spinal cord surface and then from the efferent neuron it moves to the effector area that is the muscle that will cause the movement of the knee jerk. So this is how the reflex action happens. Same way for our hand when we are you know like pulling our hands back so the muscles that actually pull the hand back the effector is that muscle and the information to the effector is brought about with the help of efferent arterioles. Any doubts? Hmm? This was like the reflex action and they have given the example of a knee jerk reflex. 
but this same thing can happen for the elbow reflex also that is the case when you touch something really hot or something really cold you draw your hand back so always remember that the effector is not the organ directly for example knee knee is not the effector but the muscles that will pull up because of this stimulus that is provided that becomes the effector so with this we have completed the reflex action and the reflex arc the thing to remember over here is that during the reflex action since the um, reaction or the what do you say the result it has to be very quick so that is why the impulses are not carried to the brain rather it returns from the spinal cord so tell me now do you people have any doubts this part is clear <clears throat> Hmm? Yes, ma'am. Any doubts? Also, you're sure that uh, all of these other things are not there in the syllabus, right? The eyes, the ear and everything is not there, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, with this, we have completed the chapter. They have removed so many things from the syllabus, right? So, it, it is a little bit boon. You people can take the advantage of it since... Some topics have been removed. You can, you know, like up till reflex action. Did you people find anything that uh, like seemed difficult? No, no, no. All right. All right. Now take five minutes. Go through the chapter. Tell me if you have any doubts. And then we'll start a new chapter.
Yes, students, any doubts? No, ma'am. Sure, the whole chapter is clear? Yes, ma'am. All right, very good. All right, then let's start a new chapter. That is going to be chemical control and coordination. And once we are done with that chapter, I think we'll be done with human physiology at all. Like the whole complete human physiology. And after uh, that, I think that there will be only uh, that chapter left, right? Uh, we still have uh, plant growth and development to do, right? Photosynthesis is done, respiration yes, tissues is done, right? We still have a uh, plant growth. Okay. Uh, which one do you want to start? Do you want to start uh, chemical control and coordination or do you want to start plant growth and development? Hmm? It's chemical control and integration, right? The name of the chapter. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and in that chapter also is like something deleted? No, everything is there. Everything is there, all right. And I think that's a little longer chapter. So let's start with that. Okay. Second, I'm loading it on my screen. You know, it's so hot over here that I'm not able to speak properly. It's like my mouth is getting so dry. <clears throat> Just one second. Okay, well, how do you people feel about this chapter? Like this is an interesting chapter, isn't it? Is it interesting according to you also or is it boring? Interesting. All right. Now we're going to start with the chemical control and coordination. So you have already learned that the neural system provides a point-to-point -point rapid coordination among organs. The neural coordination is fast, but it is short-lived. As the nerve fibers do not innervate all the cells of the body and the cellular functions need to be continuously regulated, a special kind of coordination and integration has to be provided. This function is carried out by the hormone. The neural system and the endocrine system jointly coordinate and regulate the physiological functions of the body. Now, as I told you that the neural system as well as the endocrine system is very closely regulated. Now, the endocrine and the exocrine. First, before that, you should know that there is endocrine gland and then there is exocrine gland. Do you people know the difference between them? Any, like, do you remember it from class 11? Of this, yeah, here and there. Hmm? Uh, one of them is like ductless gland. I don't know which one. Yes, endocrine glands are ductless gland, meaning they do yeah. not have, yeah, ducts. Meaning they do not need any vessel or any pipeline, if you want to understand in a layman language, they do not need any pipeline so as to transmit their secretion. Now, the secretions of endocrine gland, they are hormones. Now, these hormones, they do not need anything to be transmitted. So, it is ductless and it is directly released into the bloodstream of our body. But if we talk about the exocrine gland, those are situated with ducts. So, those are the duct glands. So, endocrine glands lack ducts and hence are called as ductless glands. Their secretions are called as hormones. The classical definition of a hormone as a chemical produced by the endocrine glands 
and released into the blood and transported to a distantly located target organ has current scientific definition. Now, what is a hormone? Hormone is non-nutrient chemical. Non-nutrient means it's of no importance to us as far as nutrition is as, like goes. It does not provide us any energy. So, it is non-nutrient chemical and it acts as an intercellular messenger, messenger in between the cells. And they are produced in trace amounts. The new definition covers a number of a number of new molecules in addition to the hormones that are secreted by organized endocrine plants. Invertebrates possess very simple endocrine system with few hormones, whereas a large number of chemicals acts as hormone and provide coordination in the vertebrates. The human endocrine system is described here. Now, the endocrine glands and hormones producing diffuse tissues or cells located in different parts of our body constitute the endocrine system. The pituitary gland, pineal gland, thyroid, adrenal, pancreas, parathyroid, thymus and gonads, that is the testes in males and ovaries in females, are the organized endocrine bodies in our body. In addition to these, some other organs such as the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the kidney and the heart also produces hormones. A brief account of the structure and function of all major endocrine glands and hypothalamus of the human body is given. Now, the hypothalamus. We did discuss that hypothalamus is a part of forebrain. Now, the hypothalamus is the basal part of diencephalon forebrain and it regulates a wide spectrum of body functions. It contains several groups of neurosecretory cells, which are known as nuclei, very important, which produces hormones. These hormones regulate the synthesis and secretion of pituitary hormones. However, the hormones produced by the hypothalamus are of two types. The one type is releasing hormone, which can cause the pituitary to release hormones. The other will be inhibiting hormone that will cause the pituitary to inhibit the secretion. For example, there is a hypothalamic hormone called as the GnRH, that is gonadotropin release in hormone. It stimulates the pituitary to synthesis and release of gonadotropin. On the other hand, there is tomatostatin, which is released from the hypothalamus and it inhibits the release of growth hormone from the pituitary. So, like the hypothalamus has two types of glands that are released. One is the releasing hormone, one is the inhibiting hormone. It does not have any direct contact with any organ. It only acts on the pituitary. These hormones originating in the hypothalamic neurons pass to axons and are released from the nerve ending. These hormones reach the pituitary gland to a portal circulatory system and regulate the functions of the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is under the direct neural regulation of the hypothalamus. So see, we by reading this are seeing that the pituitary gland is actually controlled by the hypothalamus. Either it is indirectly controlled through the anterior side of the pituitary or under the direct neural regulation. Now talking about the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is located in a bony cavity known as cella tersica and is attached to the hypothalamus by a stalk. It is divided anatomically into adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis. Adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis are the parts of pituitary gland. Adenohypophysis consists of two portions, that is pars distalis and pars intermedia. The pars distalis region of pituitary, commonly called as the anterior pituitary, produces GH, that is growth hormone, prolactin, thyroid stimulating hormone, adenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH, follicle stimulating hormone. These are the hormones that are like secreted by the pars distalis of the pituitary, which is known as the anterior pituitary. Pars intermedia secretes only one hormone known as melanocyte stimulating hormone. This is from the pars intermedia. However, in humans, the pars intermedia is almost merged with the pars distalis. Neurohypophysis, that is the pars nervosa, also known as the posterior pituitary, 
stores and releases two hormones called as oxytocin and vasopressin which are actually synthesized by the hypothalamus so don't like don't get confused that uh, the oxytocin and vasopressin are synthesized by the pituitary no it is not it is actually synthesized by the hypothalamus and what does the posterior pituitary do it stores and releases these hormones and then like the hypothalamus synthesizes these hormones and then they transmit it to the neurohypophysis this is the reason why the like the posterior pituitary is under the direct neural regulation of hypothalamus now over secretion of growth hormone stimulates abnormal growth of the body leading to gigantism for people who have excessive growth hormone in their body they will grow really tall and again those who have really less they will go like they will be dwarfed so see anything that is secreted in a large number we'll call that as hyper secretion what am i writing okay hyper secretion means say like the stuff or the hormone that is being secreted much more than it is required and hyper secretion of growth hormone causes gigantism then the less hormone is is being secreted then we'll call it as hypo secretion such as hypo secretion of growth hormone causes dwarfism now excess secretion of this like hyper secretion of growth hormone if it is done in the early childhood then the human will become giant or if it is hypo secreted then it will then the human will become a dwarf but the hyper secretion of growth hormone in adults especially in the middle age can result in severe disfigurement maybe one part of the body will grow very big such as the face or the hand this is known as acromegaly or which may lead to serious complications and premature death if unchecked this disease is hard to diagnose in early stages and, and often goes undetected for many years until changes in the external features are noticeable so this is about the uh, secretion of the pituitary uh, hormone that is the growth hormone and this hormone is actually stimulated to be released by the releasing hormone which at the, that is g growth hormone releasing hormone that is from hypothalamus now the next hormone that is prolactin it regulates the growth of the mammary glands and formation of milk in them thyroid stimulating gland stimulates the synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormones from the thyroid gland acth that is adenocorticotropic hormone it stimulates the synthesis and secretion of steroid hormones that is glucocorticoid steroid means it is derived from cholesterol or fat now where is it released from so adrenal cortex the lh and the fsh they stimulate gonadal activity meaning they are responsible in the reproduction aspect meaning during the gametogenesis and hence are known as gonadotrophins in males the lh stimulates the synthesis and secretion of the hormone that is androgen that is the male hormone and in female the fsh and androgen sorry in the males the fsh and androgen regulate spermatogenesis it will cause the formation of sperm now talking about female the luteinizing hormone it will induce ovulation ovulation means release of the mature secondary oocyte of fully mature graphen follicles and maintains the corpus luteum formed from the remnants of the corpus uh, like uh, graphen follicles after ovulation so maintaining that corpus luteum is also a function of luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone stimulates growth and development of the ovarian follicle in the female now the melanocyte stimulating hormone which is secreted from the pars intermedia it acts on the melanocytes that is melanin containing cells and it regulates pigmentation of the skin for those people that have a darker colored skin they have more melanin in their body more melanin is because msh is acting on the melanocyte now coming on to the next hormone that is oxytocin it acts on the smooth muscles of our body and stimulates their contraction in females it stimulates a vigorous contraction of uterus at the time of childbirth and milk ejection from the mammary gland 
this is a like a hormone which is involved in the birth aspect of in the case of females then there is vasopressin yesterday only we discussed this is adh anti diuretic hormone it acts at the kidney and stimulates the reabsorption of water and electrolytes by the distal tubule dct and therefore reduce the loss of water through diuretic hence it is also known as anti diuretic hormone now an impairment affecting synthesis or release of adh results in a diminished ability of the kidneys to conserve water leading to water loss and dehydration now this condition is known as diabetes insipidus when insulin is not produced enough in our body then that is diabetes mellitus and because of the under secretion of adh it is known as diabetes insipidus now talking about the pineal gland also you know one very interesting thing is that the pituitary gland is called as the master gland okay and the greatest thing to know that the hypothalamus since it regulates the secretion of pituitary so it is known as master of the master gland because it regulates the secretion of the pituitary hormones moving forward the pineal gland the pineal gland is located on the dorsal side of the forebrain pineal gland secretes a hormone which is known as melatonin now melanin and melatonin or melatonin is like are, both of them are very different hormones and you must remember that don't get confused in between melatonin plays a very important role in the regulation of our 24 hour or diurnal rhythm of our body it helps in maintaining the normal rhythms of sleep wake cycle <clears throat> it helps in maintaining the normal sleep wake cycle body temperature these two things right and in addition melatonin also influences metabolism pigmentation and menstrual cycle as well as our defense capability see there will be a time like for example if we are not feeling sleepy at all now after a while when you know when the time comes maybe later in the night maybe earlier in the night for some people we do feel sleepy our body has a biological clock on which we run and that clock is actually maintained by the melatonin hormone that is actually regulates our sleep wake cycle the temperature that our body has so everything is regulated very nicely and that is because of melatonin moving on to the next gland up till now do you have any doubts hmm? no ma'am sure yes ma'am okay now moving on there is the thyroid gland the thyroid gland is composed of two lobes which are connected or which are located on the either side of the trachea the trachea the uh, windpipe it it has thyroid gland located on the either side both the lobes are interconnected with a thin flap of connective tissue called as isthmus now this isthmus please be careful not to mess it up with infundibulum ampulla and isthmus the parts of the fallopian tube it's very confusing and it can get confusing but be careful the thyroid gland is composed of the follicles and stromal tissues each thyroid follicle is composed of follicular cells enclosing a cavity these follicular cells synthesize two hormones that is tetraiodothyronine or thyroxine that is t4 and triiodothyronine that is t3 iodine is essential for the normal rate of hormone synthesis from the thyroid gland deficiency of iodine in our diet results in hypothyroidism hypo means less so the thyroid gland secretes the thyroid hormone or thyroxine so when iodine is not there or not sufficient iodine is there in our body so we can suffer from hypothyroidism under secretion of the thyroid gland hormone and because of this the enlargement of the thyroid gland will take place and that disease is known as goiter this this portion gets swollen hypothyroidism during pregnancy causes defective development and maturation of the growing baby leading to stunted growth that is known as cretinism mental retardation 
low IQ, abnormal skin, deaf mutism, etc. So this is for the baby. The, it's like less iodine in the food during pregnancy can cause all these things in the baby. In adult women, hypothyroidism may cause menstrual cycle to become irregular due to cancer of the thyroid gland or due to development of nodules. Now, when the cancer happens, cancer means uncontrolled division. It will keep on dividing and dividing. So when that happens, then the hyperthyroidism takes place, meaning excessive thyroid hormone secretion takes place. And that is also very dangerous. Why? Because it causes exosthalmic goiter. It is another form of goiter and it is a form of hyperthyroidism. Goiter is a form of hypothyroidism like as a result and exosthalmic goiter is a result of hyperthyroidism. It is characterized by the enlargement of the thyroid gland and at that point of time, protrusion of the eyeballs, the eyeballs start to, you know, be out of the eye socket, sort of a little bit protruded out. Increased basal metabolic rate, that is BMR, the BMR increases, the weight loss is also there and all of these are the symptoms of a disease known as Graves' disease. disease. Thyroid hormones play an important role in the regulation of the basal metabolic rate. These hormones also support the process of red blood cell formation, that is erythropoiesis. Thyroid hormones control the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Maintenance of water and electrolyte balance is also maintained by or influenced by thyroid hormone. The thyroid gland also secretes a protein hormone known as thyrocalcitonin, TCT, which regulates the blood calcium levels. So in our body, the blood calcium levels is also regulated by the thyrocalcitonin hormone. So this is about the thyroid gland and its secretion. And it is very, you can say, intricate and complex. So be uh, like pay attention to thyroid gland also because, you know, many a times we don't pay attention enough. We pay attention to the pituitary and the hypothalamus and everything. And then very depth questions comes from uh, thyroid gland. Moving forward, we have parathyroid gland. In humans, four parathyroid glands are present on the back side of the thyroid. One pair each in the two lobes of the thyroid. The parathyroid gland secretes a peptide hormone. Peptide means a proteinaceous hormone, which is known as parathyroid hormone or parathormone. The secretion of parathormone is regulated by the circulating levels of calcium ion. Parathyroid hormone increases the calcium levels in the body or in the blood. The PTH acts on the bones and stimulates the process of bone reabsorption. Meaning resorption, meaning the like demineralization, meaning calcium from the bones are released and brought into the blood. That is known as dissolution of the bone. PTH also stimulates reabsorption of calcium by the renal tubules and increases calcium depositive absorption from the digested food. It is thus clear that it is a hypercalcemic hormone, meaning that it can increase the blood calcium levels from variety of ways. So it has like TCT regulates the blood calcium level and parathormone also does that. So they do they both have a role in the Calcium balance in the body. So both of them are associated like sort of together. Only one is from the parathyroid gland and one is from the thyroid. Clear? Parathyroid and thyroid glands are clear? Hmm? Any doubts? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now coming on to thymus. The thymus gland is a lobular structure located between the lungs behind sternum. Sternum is our bone of the axial skeleton, right? On the ventral side of the aorta. The thymus plays a major role in the development of the immune system. This gland secretes the peptide hormone which is known as thymosin. Thymosins play a major role in the differentiation of T lymphocytes which provide cell-mediated immunity. The T lymphocyte is there in our body and that is from the thymus only. 
In addition, the thymosins also promote production of antibodies to provide humoral immunity. The immunity in the blood is the humoral immunity and that is also provided by the thymosins. Thymus is degenerated in old individuals, resulting in a decreased production of thymosin. As a result, the immune responses of old persons become weak because their thymus, that gland only, starts getting degenerated as the old age arises. Let's just keep it till thymus only, okay? Because I think now you're getting tired, isn't it? 